Hey friends, it's good to be with you again. Today we're going to talk about searching and the relative efficiencies of various search methods that we might implement uh, in the algorithms that we choose in our programs. Searching comes in three general flavors that we can implement a number of different ways. There's a linear searching, binary searching, and finally index searching. And they have, each has uh, pros and cons, each has a cost associated with it. And when we know those pros and cons and we know the costs associated with it, we can make better choices as to what algorithm we want to choose. Now, some of the search algorithms uh, accomplish their task by simply poking around, by looking around in the list until we find the item or we reach the end of the list. A linear approach is uh, just such an algorithm. A linear approach starts at one end of the set and simply proceeds to the other end of the set. Either it hits the value or it hits the end of the list and if it hits the end of the list that tells your program that the value you're searching for isn't in there. Now if you begin to look at your your big O um, efficiency on this type of an algorithm it's really going to be dependent on how big the list is and you're going to really have to consider your best case your worst case, so your best case would be it's the very first item in the list, worst case is it's the last item in the list, and your average is of course somewhere around the middle. Given the size of the list and how far up and down the list you have to search, uh, that's gonna, if, gonna affect the relative efficiency of this type of an algorithm. There are a couple of things we can do to improve the efficiency of a linear search. We could order the list. And that way, if we get, uh, say, midway through the list, and we find that the numbers we're looking at are uh, greater than the number we're searching for, we know that the number is not going to be in existence in the list. But the downside of that is we'd probably choose a different algorithm for that. We could also do something called probability ordering, which is we're going to take those items that are most likely to be searched for and put them up at the front of the set, uh, at the front of the data set. Your computer does that with uh, your file structure. Now, if we're going to go to the trouble of ordering a list, uh, we can probably think about using a binary search method. Uh, this method is a divide and conquer method. That is, we're going to divide the list. Uh, now, we use an ordered list, of course, and then we divide that list in half. And the number has a chance of being in the bottom half or the top half of the list. Once we decide which that is, of course, we discard the other half and don't bother searching. And then we divide that list again, then we divide that list again, then we divide that list again. Now, this is an O log N uh, efficiency, uh, but it requires that your data set be ordered up front. So you've got to factor in the cost of ordering that data set. Either you're going to order it uh, as you place the items in the data list, or you're going to have to do a, a sort alg or a sort uh, function uh, that puts your list in, uh, in the proper order. So looking around really isn't our most efficient strategy. Uh, as we said, the big O uh, efficiency on the linear search is ON, and uh, the binary search is O log N. An index search is a much more efficient way of locating a data element. And hashing is the tool that we use to implement that index search. What we want to do with any hashing algorithm, our goal is to locate a data value within a data set in a single step. And we do that by following a formula uh, the same formula that we use to place the data into the list is the formula that we use to locate the data item in the list. When we're thinking about what type of a hashing method, what type of an algorithm to choose, we have to balance out two factors. That is the size of the data set 
and the size of the container. One of the advantages of hashing is that it allows us to use a smaller data container, a smaller data construct to hold X number of data elements. And we do that because we don't have to, we're not going to randomly place the items in there, we're going to place them in in a specific order. There is one further thing that we need to keep in consideration, and that is collisions. What a collision is, and we'll touch back on this, but a collision is basically when two data items try to write themselves into the same slot in our list. Mod division is the simplest of the hash algorithms. Basically, we take the key value, that is the value that we want to place into the list, and we mod it by the size of the data container. So in the example that we see here, we see employee ID 121267. We mod it by 307, which is the size of the list, and that gives us an index of two. That means I will take the employee ID and I will insert it into to the second subscript of my list. Real simple, nice and clean. Tends to generate a lot of uh, collisions. Uh, tends to cluster quite a bit as well. The digit extraction hash is, is a mechanical hash. We're not doing anything mathematical here. In fact, we take the, the ID the, the employee ID, for example, and we treat it like a string. We mechanically extract, in this case, the first, the third, and the fourth digits. We combine them together, and that gives us an index value of 394. This works um, as long as the values that you're trying to hash into your table are dissimilar enough. That is, uh, if the too many numbers are the same in those positions, you're going to end up with an awful lot of collisions. The mid-square hash, uh, we're going to take uh, the value of the, the key that we want to hash. Uh, we're going to uh, square it, extract the middle of the result, and then take that as our as our hash number. If it's too big, we can always mod it by the size of the table. Fold shift, uh, again, a mechanical uh, slash a mathematical algorithm. Uh, we take a number, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that would be the, the whole number. And then we take and break it apart, um, moving one item above another another, adding those numbers up together, and then that gives us the hash key of 1368. Again, if that's bigger than the table, we would mod it by the table size. Another thing we can do, especially if we are considering hashing by characters, is to take the ASCII value of those characters. So we have CIS. We want to uh, take the, the sum of those characters. So 67 plus 73 plus 83 gives us an index value of 223. Again, if the characters that you're going to be trying to insert into your list are similar, are you going to end up with a lot of collisions? Now, every time that we design a hash algorithm, we have to also have some method for resolving collisions. Every hash algorithm requires some way to handle collisions because every single one of them is going to generate a collision. Remember that a collision is when two values are attempting to write themselves into the same location. That is, your hash algorithm generated the same key or the same index for two different key values. When we are evaluating what type of collision resolution method to follow, are there are a couple of other things that we need to take into consideration. First, clustering. Clustering is the tendency of your uh, collision resolution algorithm to continue to write items to the same spot. That is that you build up a group of 
uh, a group of items around a certain location and what happens there is you build this this mushrooming group of uh, hashed values uh, which eats up all the available space around your item and then that causes the next item that gets hashed in there to have to find yet another place and yet another place. Another factor to take into consideration is the load factor. The load factor is basically the number of items that you're going to insert into a list um, divided into the size of that list. About 75% is the ideal load factor that we're looking for. The simplest method of resolving collisions is called linear probing. And what that is, is basically once we've placed an item, once we have a collision, we just look for the next available space. So in this case, uh, we, have, we have posted the string lives into the table at subscript one. When the next value Elvis gets hashed, uh, he comes in and gets written into subscript three. The next item that comes in, David runs into a collision against Liv. So he hashed through your algorithm, whatever it was, and he generated the same key. So now he's bumped into lives. Now, because lives is already in there, we can't put David in there. So linear probing says, I'm going to go lo look, I'm going to probe the list for the next empty location. And so he looks for the next empty location and finds a space in number two, writes himself there, and then we hash the next value. Now, there are a couple things we want to think about, some conditions that we have to take into account when we use linear probing. Think about linear probing as uh, just continuing to walk down the list. Now, eventually, it's going to walk off the end of the list. So one of the things we have to think about is that we have, uh, we've run off the end of the list, and we want to make sure that the linear probing rolls around and continues to probe starting at the top of the list. Um, if we hit a value uh, in that linear probe, we need to be able to jump over that value, and we need to make sure that the, thing, the, the algorithm doesn't crash when we hit something at the top or the bottom of the list. So just some things you've got to keep in mind. And we can certainly improve this, even though it's simple, it can be made a little bit more efficient. The first thing we can do is increase the table capacity, that is the size of the container. By doing that though, we begin to defeat one of the advantages of hashing. And so we wanna be very careful in doing that. If we find that the linear probe is slowing us down, it's creating a lot of clustering, uh, we could possibly implement a different method of collision resolution, or we could use a different uh, primary hash algorithm. Either one uh, can help us to improve uh, the, the clustering and the relative efficiency of the list. Now, I want you to remember that we're talking right now about the front end, that is placing items into the list. When we go, to search for an item, the linear probing has to apply as well because when I hit the first location and I find that the item I'm looking for is not there, I need to follow that same linear probe that you use to write the item to walk down the list until I find my item. If I walk down and I hit an empty spot, then I'm gonna know that my item is not in your list. Now, double hashing attempts to improve upon the linear probe, and that is when I, when I hit a collision on a certain spot, instead of just walking down the list and looking for an empty spot, I am going to rehash the value. So in the example that we have up in front of us here, we have a key value of 166702. I'm going to mod it by 307, and that gives me an index of one. So if I pop into one and there's already a value there, I'm going to, instead of just walk down the table, I'm going to rehash that item. 
Okay, so my my item is going to come back in. I'm going to say I found a collision, and I'm going to take um, I'm going to take and run through a a couple of steps in a formula. I'm going to rehash that and go to a new spot. So my initial index value was one. I had a collision there. I took and divided uh, the key by the size of the table. And then I've gone and taken the, uh, that, that result, uh, added the collision key, minded it by 307, and uh, I've come back in and I get a new hash value. I go to 237. If there's a collision at 237, I follow this same method. Now when I go to search, this is how I'm going to find my item. See, mathematically, it works on both sides. It will walk me from place to place to place until I find the item or the item's not in the list. Now, both of those have a relative cost. Uh, the linear probe, uh, more so than the double hashing or, or one of the open, open indexing strategies, they have a cost, though, in terms of stealing from future efficiency. And what that means is when I do a linear probe, let's say, and walk down the list, I place an item in uh, the, second, the, the second index value. That index value belongs to somebody else. And so when I go to hash the value that actually belongs there, I've already got a collision built in there. So the more that the more that I fill, the more the table that I fill with values that don't belong there, uh, the less efficient my my collision resolution becomes. Now a change resolution has a low cost. It's not zero cost, but it has a relatively low cost. What a chain resolution does is that we don't create a second hash key. We don't even do a linear probe. What we do is that once, uh, once an item has been indexed to a particular spot in the list, we simply build a chain of items that hash to that to that spot. So you see the table that we have in front of us, uh, the, the six elements, it's full. So the next value that comes into the table is going to run into an automatic collision. So Paula comes into the list and uh, her name hashes to the index value of one. Now because Willie's already in there, Paula can't be placed in that list. So instead of looking for another spot, I'm simply going to build a chain. And what I would do is build a linked list that is attached to uh, the index one so that when I go searching for Paula, I do my, my hash algorithm. It says go look in spot number one. I look in spot number one. It has Willie in there. Then I simply walk down, traverse the link list until I find the item I'm looking for or I reach the end of the list. So uh, Kiko comes in. He belongs in the Jesse spot. I attach him there. Now Lee comes in, he hashes to the number one spot. Willie's already there, so we have a collision. So I walk out to the link list. I see Paula is there. I add another node with Lee in it, and I attach him to Paula. So hashing is uh, relatively simple. It requires some experimentation. You need to understand your algorithms. You need to understand your collision resolution so that for the data set and the size of the container that you're trying to work with, uh, you can come up with the most efficient choices on both sides. This is where your understanding of Big O will come into play. I'm glad you were with me for this uh, short little tutorial. I hope you found it helpful. We'll talk to you again soon.